Give it up for the kids. Yes. Love that. You know, see, as we look at this, we are created for greatness. And uh, we're going to go into the next five weeks and talk about how we are created for greatness. God has designed us, and he's designed us for greatness. And in the midst of that great, there's that light again. In the midst of our greatness, that thing loves me. And... Um, we're to talk about this and finding understanding as I'm created for greatness. One of the questions that I wanted to ask and I started to, as I was putting this series together, was trying to understand when I look at this, I, we've been on this series of identity. Who am I? And so I want to kind of start this series with that question on one of the greatest principles that we are designed for. And I ask myself, who am I? When I say that I am designed for greatness, I have to ask myself, well, what am I designed for? Who am I? And I find in one principle that God has designed, and I want to place this principle on topic today for us to see and to know that God has made us for greatness. And it reminds me of a story of this professor. He was this, uh, uh, this biochemist, and uh, he was on this new topic, and he was the specialist in the world on this topic. And so he was end up going around from universities, and he was going around doing all these speeches. And, and uh, he had this, uh, this driver that was with him, and this driver went with him everywhere. And this driver was listening to all these speeches. He listened to this professor again and again and again. And one time the professor was sitting in the back of the car as the driver was driving, and the professor said, Man, I'm so exhausted. This thing is so tiring. And, and the, the driver goes, it's not tiring. I could do your speech. I know your speech. I've heard it hundreds of times and you're doing it. I know your speech. And the driver. And so the professor goes, well, fine. So we get up there and the professor's getting ready to do his next speech. And so he introduces himself as the driver and that he has the professor here. And so he introduces the driver as the professor. And so the driver comes out, grabs a hold of the stadium the st stadium, whatever, <laughs> grab a hold of the podium, there we go, the podium, and he gives this beautiful speech, this biochemist speech, and the driver nails it. And so the driver's all done, and he's just ready to conclude, and quickly out comes one of the, the local teachers, and the teacher comes out and goes, does anybody have any questions for him then? And now all of a sudden he's in the hot seat. And one of the kids stands up and asks this really in-depth question on the biochemist response. And he asks this really in-depth question. And the driver goes, oh, man, that question is so easy. I'm going to have my driver answer that question. <laughs> so see what happens no matter what, no matter who you are, no matter who you think you are, sooner or later, you are going to be found out. Your cover is going to be blown. When you don't know who you are, sooner or later, I promise you this, your cover is going to be blown and you will be found out. So the question we have to ask ourselves is, who am I? Who are we? Who are we and what are we trying to do? And what are we trying to be? You see, when we ask this question, we have to take it to the sense of understanding who we are. And we can take it to the root of understanding that we are children of God. 
You see, the Bible is very clear about this. The Bible says this, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Because it is by grace that we have been saved. So when we call on the name of the Lord, the Bible is clear, we become children of God. Woo! Right? We should all be excited right there. That's right. Because someday, when the pearly gates open the door and the trumpet is sound, you already know, don't you? The rapture's coming. And what's going to happen? I'm going to go. There's my rapture pose. Right? There it is. We are children of God. When I understand who I am, I understand this. I am a child of God. So when I put this as our base today, I understand that I understand scripture is very clear and I understand that when I call on the name of the Lord, I am forgiven. And when I do that, I am a child of God and I am only saved because of the grace of God. So let's put this as our foundation. Let's put this as as our, our, our foundation for our building of this message this morning. You see, when we look at this, one of the challenges that we have, as I say, I am saved by grace, one of my desires is to be, is to be filled with the Spirit, is to be walking in the Spirit every day, to be chasing the Spirit every day in the things that I think, in the things and the choices that I make every day. So what do I want to do? I I am a child of God who is saved by grace, and I am filled with the Spirit. I'm trying to keep in step with the Spirit. You see, as I do this, I ask myself, how? How do I do this? How do I keep in step with the Spirit in my life? And I must understand one of God's rules. This isn't something that I made up. This isn't something that some great philosopher has put together. This has happened since the day that God has placed seeds on this planet. This the you that this the, you, the where was that coming from? I don't know. So, but ever since the day that God has designed this, it has been since the day He put seeds on the planet, and that is the, that of sowing and reaping. What you sow is what you reap, and if there is one thing that we must know is that we are designed to be sowers. See this? You are designed to be a sower. It doesn't matter who you are, what you think, where you go, what you place. You are constantly sowing. You are designed. You will sow. I promise you. Every day, all the time, you will sow. We are sowers. This is God's design for you. This is God's design and purpose. You are a sower. You are a sower. You see, we must understand the principle of this. Every idea. Everything starts with a seed. Everything. Everything starts an idea. You have an idea to start a business? It started with the seed of the idea. You want to put a, a, a dream together? You want great achievements? You want to put a building together? You look at your life? It starts with the seed. God created the world on a seed principle. This is God's idea and God's principle that he has put together, and it is about you and I. This is who you are. Everything starts with a seed. Everything starts with a seed. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 11, God said, let the land have seed-bearing plants, and the trees bear fruit with seeds in it, according to their varieties. You see, I don't know if you've ever heard the old cliche is you can say that uh, anyone can count the seeds that it takes in an apple, but only God can count the apples that are in a seed. You see, as I look at this and we see the replication and the multiplication of seeds and sowing, we look at this. Look, I mean, look, I'm from Montana, so there's wheat farms everywhere out there where I grew up. It's I mean, interesting to me is that one seed One seed makes about five plants, about five stems. Off of those five stems, there's about 22 seeds per head. With five heads per plant, what are we talking about? One seed makes over 100, up to 110. You see, the 
the law of seeing, uh, of seeds and, and planting, the law that everything starts from a seed, we see that it has benefits to it. Something is going to happen. When you plant a seed, something is going to grow. And it is usually of exponential growth in every seed. Every seed has exponential growth. Every seed, right? Every seed has exponential growth. Every seed. You take those 110 seeds and you plant them. And then you plant their seeds. The law of multiplication is amazing at how exponential seeds are. And we see this. The law is this. That every seed that is planted has exponential growth. In Job chapter 8 verse 7 it says, Though what you start, with what you start with seems small and insignificant, you'll end up in the future with much. We need to be people who are sowing in the Spirit. We are people who need to be putting seeds into our life, into those lives around us, and sowing to the Spirit, not opposite. You see, I think this brings a big question to us, that we must ask ourselves. We must ask ourselves a critical question, and that is, are the seeds that I am planting, are they seeds that's going to bring me exponential growth in my relationship with the Lord, or is it going to bring me exponential separation from the Lord? You see, Paul gives us some great thoughts about this, the principle of sowing and reaping. And what we see Paul doing in this, in, this, in this section of Galatians is that he's given us uh, illustrations of what it means to be a Christian and what it is to be guided by the freedom of the Spirit. So how should we really be walking our lives? What kind of seeds should we be planting? Are really Spirit-filled, Spirit-guided, as I live, how am I planting? And we must understand the law of reproduction. The law of reproduction is this. Whatever I sow is what I will reap. If I go out in Montana and I plant a field of wheat, I've said this many times, if I go out and plant a field of wheat, I'm not going to go out there expecting corn. If you do, you have a problem. You're not going to get any corn. If you go out there and plant a field of corn, you're not going to get wheat. We know this. This has been a principle from the foundation that God has made this earth. This is God's principle. What you sow is what you reap. I do have one situation where that kind of messed up on me. This last year, Rhonda and I planted a bunch of pumpkins and then we planted a bunch of squash right beside them, and we had pumpkin squash. I don't know what happened, but we're not doing that again because we had a million of them. They were decorations. That's what they were. You see, the deal is when we understand the law of reproduction, we understand that this is something that God has designed from the very beginning. What you plant is what you sow. What you plant is what you sow. And as you sow that, you will see the crop of what you planted. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 10 says, Do not be, de be deceived. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not come weary in doing good, for at the proper time, at the proper time, I'm lost here, at the proper time we must see, Woo! got to pull them up. For the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. You see, let me back up to that. Verse 8. Whoever sows to please the flesh 
from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for a proper time will, be, will we reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunities, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. You see, as we look at these principles concerning our, spirit, concerning our spiritual sowing, we see that, first of all, we reap what we sow. And when we look at this, we must understand that this is a warning and this is a promise. It's a warning and it's a promise. You will reap what you sow. It's a warning and it's a promise. Whatever I dish out, I will give back. If I, if I dish out positiveness, kindness, love, grace, compliments, I will receive that back. If I dish out a negative anger or, or, or judgment or criticism, I will find that returning to me. In Proverbs chapter 26, verse 27, it says, He who digs a pit will fall into it, and he who rolls a stone will have that roll back on him. And Hosea chapter 10, verse 13 says, You planted wickedness, and now you have reaped evil. You see, I think so many times inside our lives, we sow wild oats on Friday night, and then on Sunday morning, we want to see a crop failure. Right? We find ourselves sowing things that we should not sow. And then we pray for a crop failure. You see, we cannot sow irresponsibility and reap success. We cannot sow laziness and reap a reward. We cannot sow stinginess and find and reap a blessing. This reminds me of the story of Jacob. He cheated his brother. Jacob cheated his father, and his father-in-law cheated him. Hammond was hung to death on the gallows that he had prepared for someone else. You see, if you sow a thought, you will reap an action. And when you sow an action, you will reap a habit. And when you sow a habit, you will reap a character. And when you sow a character you will reap your destiny. Who do you want to be known for? We reap what we sow. We must understand that this is a warning, but it is also one of the greatest promises. This is God's principle. This is God's rule, and no one can pull anything over God. If we plant wheat, we expect wheat. If we plant Things of evil, we will reap it. If we plant things into our life that are destructive, we must listen to the warning. We find ourselves at times in habitual situations. Many times in our lives, one of the things that we fight is the same thing over and over. One of the greatest lies that the enemy can, can breathe into you is that this is just the way you are. You are just an angry person, so just embrace it. That's who you are. One of the greatest lies is that when the enemy has us in a habitual thought process and we continue to sow that and sow that and sow that and we want a different response, but we forget to come to God. We forget because this warning is given to us. This principle is handed to us. And we have the challenge to turn this into one of the greatest promises in our life. You see, every day we have chances to sow. Every day we sow seeds every day. Have you ever said something at one time and you're like going, oh, I shouldn't have said that. Have you ever done something where you said, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Have you ever done something you like going, Woohoo! I gotta do that again, right? I gotta do that again. That was super fun. 
See, we need to find ourselves in seeing that when we sow these amazing things in our life, when we place the right things in our life, it is amazing how our lives are blessed. It is amazing at how our lives reproduce what we have sown. And when we sow into the Spirit, when we sow and encourage each other, it is amazing how that comes back. It is amazing. It multiplies. Every, every word we speak Every step we take, every decision we make leads in one direction or another. It leads us towards the promise or we don't listen to the warning. You see, if we take our lives and we sow godliness in our lives, we take deliberate thought process. We take ourselves and we discipline ourselves. It's so easy to point at somebody else and help them and discipline them. I loved when I had little kids. I thought spankings were fun. It was. I mean, I, Keaton needed one every day, no matter what he was doing. And so I I mean, it's easy to discipline kids. Don't do that. Don't put your hand on the stove. Don't run out in front of the car. Don't, don't do this. Don't. It's easy to discipline other people. But one of the most difficult things to do is to discipline yourself and to say, hey, don't touch the stove. Don't do this habitual thing. Don't look at that. Don't place that into your life. Don't let anger arise up within you. Don't, don't. One of the most toughest things to do is to discipline yourself. It's fun to point the finger at other people, <laughs> right? It's fun. But to discipline yourself, it takes work. You want to sow godly seeds in your life? It takes work. It takes discipline. You want to sow and plant things that are going to produce in your life the blessing of God? It takes discipline because you yourself, we, we, we have a conflict inside of us. Our flesh, our desires want to pull us away from the kingdom of God. They want to pull us away from our relationship with Christ. But it takes discipline to say, I am going to place this in my life and I choose to listen to this warning. I choose to listen to this promise and I place it in my life. And I choose today to plant what is right in my life. I choose. It takes discipline. It is extremely difficult, especially when you are battling a habitual sin in your life. I know a couple weeks ago I talked about anger, and it was amazing to me how many people we begin to talk and open up a conversation about dealing with anger in their life. You see, when we have a habitual draw that is against the character of God, we need to challenge ourselves. We need to choose to put the blessing in our life and not the opposite. We need to plant seeds in our life that'll change our seeds, that'll change our life. We need to plant seeds that will change who we are. And by that, we, we, we have to discipline ourselves and think about it and place it into our lives. I'm telling you this, it is extremely hard work. Being a farmer in Montana, I'm telling you, it is hard work. It's hard work. You work year-round. You work all the time, from sunup to sundown. There is no end to the jobs in your life. How many can say amen to that? There's no end to your jobs. I mean, you can wake up in the morning. I mean, the first thing that happens is that the dog's there looking at his dish and saying, I need you to feed me. Right? I mean, there's, there's no end to your jobs. I mean, every time you turn around, somebody, something, some responsibility, you have jobs. You make decisions constantly throughout the day. You see, there's no end to planting good seeds. If you want the harvest, then you have to do the work. And I think one of the greatest things that destroys us is the discipline becomes hard work and we give up. We give up. We say it's too hard. 
I don't want to do this. I want to give in to my flesh. I want to give in to my habitual sin. I want to give in. I want to do it because I need to feel good, and this makes me feel good. And so we look against the warning, and we plant the seeds of destruction in our life because our flesh pushes all of our buttons. You think you have kids that can push your buttons? You push your own buttons. Right? We push our own buttons. I'm doing this because I want to. I think it's kind of like the trash. If I really liked taking out the trash, I would have no problem taking out the trash every day. I'd have no problem. But I don't like taking out the trash. That's why I just go by a trash can. Oh, it's getting full. <laughs> push that thing in there. Next thing you know, I get to put my foot in there a little bit. I don't like taking out, if we like taking out the trash, there'd be no problem taking out the trash. If we liked doing what is right, we would have no problem. But the struggle is our human nature. We struggle against this. We find ourselves at some times where the struggle becomes too much. And what do we do? We give in. We give in. You see, it takes discipline. It takes time for us to work on who we are as a Christian and understanding that God has designed us as sowers. And as I look at who I am, I must know this. I must place this into my life. I am a sower. And as I'm going throughout my day, I must ask myself, what seeds am I planting? When I ask myself, who am I? I must come back to this principle. God has designed me to be a sower. What am I sowing? I am designed for greatness. You were created for greatness. I mean, you want to talk about great? Plant one seed, you get a hundred, you take that hundred and you plant it and you get a thousand. Then the next thing you know, you have millions. You are designed for greatness. You are. That is you. You're that seed. That's an example that is given to us. You are a sower of seeds and you are designed for amazing things, great things. And what we find ourselves doing is we find ourselves sowing things that are going to produce destruction in our life. The difference is, is what are you planting? I know this. I'm going to plant. I am designed from God from the beginning of eternity. I, beginning of eternity. Beginning of the world. Something like that. I don't know where I went, but I made Brian smile. But I am designed... I'm designed to sow. I will sow. All of us. And the question is, you are designed for greatness. What are you sowing? What are we sowing? I think of struggling in difficult times. Things that we struggle with in our own life. Sometimes I think it seems like it's impossible to make it. Many of you, I've prayed with you, and you're, you're just like, I'm at the end. I, have one, I feel like I'm hanging on by one string. I, I'm at the end. I can't do this. I remember, I kind of like watching a little bit of football every now and then. And I remember when, when Sean Alexander, remember Sean Alexander was for the Seahawks? Kaboom! Yeah, uh, he, I had this video I was going to show you, but I'm not going to show you. Sean Alexander was amazing running back. You know what? Sean Alexander ran for 9,429 yards. That's 5.3 miles. That's how many yards he put down the ground running with the football in his hand. Just five miles. Just five miles. You know, well, that reminds me, and it's going to age me a little bit, but one of the greatest running backs was Walter Payton. <laughs> Walter Payton? He, you know what? Walter Payton, catch us. I mean... Sean Alexander was a pretty big guy. I mean, you get in front of Sean Alexander, you're going to be a pancake. I mean, he was he was a big guy. Big guy, big muscles, and it could hurt you. And uh, I would never want to be in front of him. But Peyton was a little guy. You know, he only weighed 202 pounds. 
just a little bit more than me. He was 5'10". Five, five, he was a little guy. He was 200 pounds. He was a 5'10". In, in 12 years, he ran the ball 16,720 some yards. You know what he did? He ran the ball 9.5 miles. 9.5 miles. I mean, 9.5 miles. When I think about that, I could do that on my bike. I mean, that's not that big of a deal. I mean, Rhonda's run like 14 marathons. I mean, that's 26.2. I mean, something like that. 18 marathons. More than 14. 18 marathons. She's run so many marathons. I mean, 9.5 miles. What's the big deal? I mean, come on. 9.5 miles. Well, when you look at this, you start to look at his story. You must look at your story. You want to talk about tough times. Could you imagine being knocked down every 4.2 yards in your life? Could you imagine trying to run a marathon? And as you're running the marathon, the sideline people would let you go 4.2 yards and then they tackle you. <laughs> ha ha, 4.2. Get up and do it again. For a marathon, could you imagine? I think you'd give up. You'd be like, this is too much. I can't do this. I can't do this. I mean, some of the greatest careers, when I look at this great career, we talk about, we get excited about. This guy was knocked down every 4.2 yards in his life. And he was pummeled by big guys who jumped on him, would poke you in the eye, would, would jump on you. I mean, it was horrid. He was stopped every time he got up. Basically, 4.2 miles. You want to talk about difficult times in your life. How do you look at this with greatness? Some of us are constantly knocked down. We take a couple steps and we're knocked down. We start to move again, we're knocked down. We start to take steps in the right way. We find ourselves in our, our, our nature and on our desires. We don't discipline ourselves and we find ourselves doing sin. We find ourselves in a gap and a distance between us and God and we're knocked down. And pretty soon we're knocked down. He's saying, oh, this is just the way that I am. I can only make 4.2 yards. And so I know I'm going to get knocked down. I'm going to go to church on Sunday. And I know by Tuesday, things are going to fall apart. This is who I am. And we believe the greatest lie of the enemy. This is who I am. Well, I'm telling you this. That is not who you are. That is not who you are. You are designed for greatness. And when you get knocked down, what do you do? You get back up. You get back up. And what you do is you draw on your, your life and who you are, your decisions. You learn from your mistakes. And what do you do? You get back up and you discipline yourself. And you try and to take myself and I discipline myself to plant the right seeds. I know that I am a sower. And because I am a sower, I am going to plant what's right. Right? And the time to start sowing is now. Don't wait for a better time. Well, when I conquer this in my life, then I'll, <laughs> I'll get my life all together, and then I'll, I'll have it down. So I'm just going gonna, gonna to keep in this lifestyle until I get a little bit older, and then I can choose to do what's right. No. You see, the, the thing is, the decision is right now. It's right now. This is who you are. The decision is it's time to start now. In Ecclesiastes chapter 11, it says, Those who wait for perfection will never plant seeds. Those who wait for perfect weather will never plant seeds. And those who look at every cloud will never reap a harvest. One of these days, I'm going to get right with God. Maybe you're sitting there right now saying, one of these days I'm going to take care of this habitual sin. One of these days I'm going to sack, I'm going to give over my life to the Lord. The time is now. The time is now. The time is to give this to God now. You are designed for greatness. You are designed for greatness. That's who you are. When the foundations of this earth were built, you were designed for greatness. Woo! We should be poking our friend going, man, you're designed for greatness.
As we look at this, we must ask ourselves, what seeds am I planting? I think one of the things that we get stuck on is we plant a seed. We wake up the next morning, we're going. I planted a tomato seed yesterday, and today I want a tomato. You see, it takes time. It takes time. It takes discipline. You say, I'm going to give this over to God. I'm going to give this up. And we find ourselves returning. You see, it takes discipline in our life. When we choose to start planting the seeds of the Spirit in our life, choosing to do what's right. It's not something you just do on Sundays. It's something that we place a discipline in our life all the time. We place this in our life daily. We place this in our life moment by moment. Constantly. We continue to keep in step with the Spirit. We continue to place us in our life. We continue. Every day I choose to plant. Every day I choose to honor what the Lord is doing in my life. Every day I discipline myself. I choose to place God in my life. I call on the name of the Lord and I have found forgiveness. You see, when you ask, when you ask, it is promised forgiveness. Since the foundations of this earth, when you ask, you are forgiven. 